So uh, before we get started, I'd like to address a couple high level things. Uh, first off, this is a technical talk. It's not nearly as technical as some of the legends I've already spoken, but we are gonna dive uh, pretty deep into the blue teamer side and the red teamer's perspective. So some knowledge in both will go a long way. We'll start off by going over examples and demos in the later slides. Uh, when we go over them, you'll notice a red team or a blue team sticker in the top right of the slide. This is meant to visually guide you through the slide so you understand which pertain to either the red team or the blue team. Let's jump in. Hi, I'm Zachary Asher. I'm a lead cybersecurity engineer on the cyber, th on the cyber threat detection and response team at FM Global. And I've been with them for the past four and a half years. Uh, primarily, I lead the purple team engagements, but I also work in content engineering and incident response. I've been in the field for the past 10 years, working across all the colors for some pretty interesting places. Uh, outside of security, I have a wife, a daughter, and I enjoy playing pickleball. Disclaimer. Now for the famous disclaimer slide. Everything I'll be going over are just my opinions uh, formed through working in various industries, research, and messing around my free time. Just to be clear, we're not targeting commercial deception solutions. We're looking at the low interaction canaries that defenders can deploy on their own. With that being said, many commercial deception solutions do utilize low interaction canaries and may implement them with some of the same techniques we're going over. With that in mind, any knowledge I may seem to have was gained through research, simple malware analysis, and lab testing. I did scour a few vendor blogs and help forums to gain an idea of their capabilities, but that's all public information. All right, so what is this whole talk even about? First, I need to make sure everybody's caught up with the basics, so I'll quickly explain deception. After that, we'll quickly jump through the differences between canaries and honeypots. These are often confused or assumed to be the same thing, but they serve different functions. Then we'll jump into an anti-deception methodology red teamers can use to reverse engineer the meaningful parts of the deception engineering process. Uh, blue teamers can also make use of the anti-deception methodology to proactively improve their canaries by anticipating the red teamers next move. After that, we'll start getting to the more technical side of the talk uh, where I go deep on five common low interaction canaries. We'll start off each example from the blue teamers perspective where we'll go over engineering and implementing the canary. Then we'll move to the red teamer perspective where I'll show you how to detect that implementation of the canary without getting caught in a few seconds. Finally, we'll end off with a Q&A where hopefully nobody will reveal their company deception techniques. And now I feel like I need to have this slide, but do I really if you're attending an anti-deception talk? Yeah. Back in the day, mines used to be filled with dangerous natural gases. Miners, instead of finding a new profession, brought canaries into the coal mine. Uh, so when they died, they knew to leave. Our canaries are the exact same as those birds. We leave them to be abused so we can live a better life. Cyber deception at its simplest form is deceiving attackers by booby trapping your environment with enticing traps called canaries. For example, upon a defender defined interaction with that canary, an alert will fire. Now, what do I mean when I say defender defined interaction? Well, for example, let's say you wanna make a canary structure around a file. You get to choose what you want the alerting interaction to be on that file. Do you want it to spawn an alert every time the file is touched? or only when it's opened. We'll dive deeper into that scenario later. Canary, breadcrumb, honey token, honey file, honey pot, honey net, honey domain, honey org, yada, yada, yada. It's pretty much a free-for-all and deception naming convention, so hurry up, miter, please. Uh, someone, may someone may hate me for trying to put a label on these, but it will. Uh, honeypots are higher interaction systems used to gather additional intelligence about the attacker's motives, capabilities, or any attributable information. They're off. Thank you. They're... Sorry, we're doing this with two laptops. And back. All right. Uh, they're often VMs, containers, or physical servers requiring storage and computing resources. And while open source honeypots are available, they're not often implemented in corporate enterprises besides as a part of commercial deception solutions. On the other hand, canaries are usually individual artifacts such as credentials, processes, files, etc. They're hidden cleverly throughout the environment in places that attackers will always enumerate. Upon a defender to find simple interaction with the canary, it'll spawn an alarm. They're often implemented as instructed in open source blogs and tooling 
And most importantly about canaries is their whole purpose is to be an alerting agent for high fidelity alarms. So why do enterprises flock towards canaries? Well, first and foremost, they create high fidelity alarms. Canaries are hidden throughout the environment with the goal of only being interacted with when it's an attacker. To do this, they live in places inaccessible the most, such as a SAM register or an LSAS. The better the canary is hidden away, the higher the fidelity of the alarm. Next is cost. They're free to implement and diverse enough in scope where you shouldn't need any additional software. Speed, this one's a bit of a toss up as my whole presentation centers around sloppy implementations due to a lack of time, most likely, I hope. Uh, but you can create effective canaries and the associated learning quickly if you're careful in your canary choice and implementation strategy. Configure. Configurability. Canaries can be easily handmade and are limited only by the imagination. They can be implemented across many different technology stacks with differing levels of aggression on the alerting interaction. Finally, less tech debt. We're not standing up servers or VMs or even containers. Main canaries are accommodating to the site and forget it lifestyle without requiring any additional maintenance. They don't ever need patching. They don't run additional software you need to get approved and they don't require computer storage resources. This is an anti-deception methodology I created to help red teamers uh, brainstorm and improve their canary detections and for blue teamers to improve their canaries. So let's walk through the methodology now. There are five phases to it. Research, anticipate, validate. No, research, anticipate, adapt, validate, and recover. Starts off in the research phase where we look to see if and how that canary has been implemented in the past by either open source blog posts or a third party. Does a third party have any documentation? Next, we analyze the engineering process for the canary. Does it require any infrastructure, an account, a service or a process or a set of permissions? Maybe there's a, new, a unique engineering requirement that we can use as a canary indicator. Maybe innumerable system artifacts are generated as part of the engineering process. The next step is to enumerate the most likely interactions with a canary that spawn an alarm. For example, are they implementing a process-based canary to spawn an alarm when the process is accessed or when the process is killed? The last step of the research phase is to analyze the implementation process. How are they spawning an alarm on interaction? Are they creating logs to alert off of? Are they sending a web or DNS request? There are many ways to alert, but defenders usually stick to either what's easiest or already being made with HTTP or DNS requests being the most likely. For the anticipate phase, we need to make a judgment call on whether the target is likely to build infrastructure solely for deception. Many organizations don't allow every random security engineer to stand up accounts and infrastructure just for deception engineering. Depending on this, the canary could utilize alternative implementation methods or be limited in nature. Onto the adapt phase, this is all about getting creative and brainstorming a bit. After researching the possible and likely interactions used to trigger the canary, we must do the inverse and find interaction options with a canary that won't spawn any alarms. Does interacting with a canary in this non-monitored manner reveal any unique IOCs that can help determine if it's a canary? What about it? And go back. What about the implementation? Where are the flaws? For example, if a canary file spawns a system log to determine it's been opened, what happens if the file is open outside your environment where you can't catch the log? Now the validate phase is all about ensuring coverage over one, the various interactions with the canary that you can alert on, and two, the, the implementation method it uses to alert. Finally, we recover and take a look at the fidelity of both the deception canary and the canary detection you're testing. If either is low fidelity or too noisy, repeat with a different implementation or interaction on the canary. Thank you all for paying attention so far. You've now made it to the fun part of the talk. Uh, for our first example, we'll be covering one of the most prevalent canaries, file access canaries. File access canaries trigger an alarm upon the canary file being accessed. Access has a couple different definitions though. It could mean touching the file, moving it, et cetera, or opening the file. 
though this commonly translates to opening the file due to the number of false positives and noise associated with file touch events. A triggered document is primarily an MS Office or PDF document that upon being open will spawn a web or DNS request to defender controlled infrastructure for alerting. From a defender's perspective, you have a few different ways you can engineer the canary to spawn an alarm. First being remote resources or abusing external relationships. It's a common technique originally spawning from malware. The defender modifies an MS Office document metadata to include a remote resource, usually an image, hosted on defender-owned external infrastructure. When the document is opened, it makes a request out for that resource, generating a log on your web server, which you then translate into an alert. Embedded objects is another common technique originally spawning from malware. The defender modifies PDF file to include an object that will fire an HTTP or DNS request to generate alert upon opening. Another implementation option for defenders is to utilize macros, uh, but due to common organization policies on disabling macro enabled documents or stripping macros at the external perimeter, we won't be looking at them. Finally, defenders could bypass modifying the canary file at all and instead utilize common log sources like Windows security event logs or Sysmon looking for process creation events on any process executing that file. The issue with this implementation is it only works inside your environment. If an attacker is able to exfiltrate the canary file without alerting, they can open it freely on any computer, not in the environment. To do this in this implementation, an attacker simply needs to zip the entire folder canary, containing the canary file and exfil that zip. You will still spawn a process creation event, but it won't specifically be on that file. So it won't generate the alarm. So now let's take a look at this triggered document canary from the red teamer's perspective. The canary the blue team made was an MS Office document utilizing the remote resources method implement, remote resources implementation method. When a document is opened, a web request is made to the external infrastructure requesting the remote resource, spawning the alarm. So how do we determine if an MS Office document is a canary without triggering the alarm at all? As you can see on the right, we simply need to unzip the file. All MS Office documents can be renamed to .zip and then unzip normally to access the document metadata. Then we use regular expressions to scan through the metadata looking for syntax indicating URLs containing a resource while excluding common Microsoft resources. Sounds too easy, right? Let's prove it with the demo. So here we are gonna have a directory with five enticing files, uh, Excel, Word, and PowerPoint. Some of these files are real and some are canary. The canaries are configured to alert with the remote resource implementation discussed. We'll start by importing my PowerShell module and then running the enum canary function against the potential canary file. The output will be a determination on whether the file is or is not a canary, the file and path, and if it's determined to be a potential canary, the match that it's calling out to. Now I am just being lazy and looping through each file, running the enum canary function on each. And so here we can see we have two non-canary documents and three canary enabled documents. Uh, the two that were real were real and the three that weren't, uh, two were calling out to an external domain and one was calling out to an internal domain. No alarms were fired and we've successfully enumerated the canary documents. So for our next example, we'll be looking at a user access canary. Uh, user access canaries trigger upon someone authenticating to a canary user. Specifically, we'll be looking at a Canary Azure service principle. These are valid but unprivileged service principles tied to an unprivileged application hosted in a defender-owned tenant. When a red teamer attempts to authenticate using the service principle, an alert is spawned. From blue teamer's perspective, you have two primary implementation options. First is to take the easy route and use a third-party generated service principle Canary. They go through the work of creating a valid app and service principle on their own infrastructure and will alert you after the authentication occurs via email or webhook. The other option is to utilize Azure infrastructure either you or your company owns. To do this, first you optionally create a new isolated tenant, then you register a new unprivileged application, which will also create the service principle unless you're using the Graph API. Next, you create a client secret for that service principle, and finally set up alerting for any authenticated requests using those credentials. Now let's look from the red teamer's perspective. Uh, so we'll be looking at both implementations as just detecting third-party canaries that are open source on their own is too easy. Uh, 
check out that Azure Service Principle login information. Thank you. <laughs> check out that Azure Service Principle login information on the right. How can we determine if that's a canary or real credentials without just assuming anything posted on Pastebin is deceptive? Well, Microsoft helps us out here with their graph API. Specifically, there's an API called named tenant relationship find tenant information by tenant ID. When called, this will give information about the tenant based on the tenant ID input. This internal API does not authenticate to the target or leave them with any logs to know they've been looked up. What's even better is the folks at AAD internals have done all the work for us and publicly host a site used to look up this information. That means we don't even need to authenticate to the graph API using our own account. So what information is provided by the API call? Well, it'll give you tenant brand, tenant ID, tenant name, tenant region, banner logo, domain, and associated domains. By performing analytics on this information and requesting a bit more via DNS, we can determine whether the service principle utilizing that tenant is a canary or not. Well, nothing's ever proven until a demo is provided, so let's jump in. Here, I'm running a PowerShell script that takes the tenant ID supplied in the potential canary as input. It starts by making a web request to AAD internal site, which runs the tenant ID against the graph API call to get the information needed for analytics. The script will then perform analytics on the existence of and values of certain properties correlated with common Azure service principle canary deployments. It'll look at if the tenant is named, if the domain is valid, if CNAME, NS, MX records exist, if there are any associated domains, and if the domain is managed. Finally, it outputs determination as to whether that tenant is used as a part of an Azure Service Principle Canary deployment process. So you can see in red there, the financial operations that on Microsoft.com tenant, this is the tenant uh, name used with Canary tokens free Azure Service Principle Canary. They never change it. Yes, don't worry, MITRE SANS, if you see your name up there, I don't have a valid service principle for you guys. I just was able to get your tenant ID and looked it up. <laughs> now, realizing that everybody doesn't use Azure, let's take a look at another cloud provider. For example, number three, we'll be looking at another user access canary, AWS API key canaries. These are valid AWS API keys for an unprivileged Defender-owned IAM user. From Blue Teamer's perspective, you have two primary implementation options. Again, you could take the easy route and have a third-party generated API, AWS API key canary created for you. They'll go through the work of creating the account, the unprivileged IAM user, the access keys, and alerting. That being said, some vendors uh, implement the canaries with a major flaw, which makes them innumerable. Uh, I won't leave you guys in suspense. The flaw is they're using the same AWS account ID to generate all their AWS API key canaries. But we'll hit on how we even get that account ID in the next two slides. Your other option for implementation is to utilize AWS infrastructure you or your company owns. To do this, optionally, you first create a new isolated account, then you create an unprivileged IAM user, followed by API access keys for that user, and set up a learning cloud trail. Now, from the Red Teamer's perspective, we'll again be looking at both implementations. Uh, so let's check out that AWS API key information on the right found on Pastebin. Again, we're left with the question of how can we determine if this is a canary or real credentials? This time, we'll use an internal AWS API to call to help us out. Secure token service get access key info is an AWS API that will decrypt the access key ID into the account ID. This API call does not authenticate to the target or generate any logs for them. It's completely internal. Now, we could have used this API directly, but thanks to at TalBerrySec, researchers have cracked the encoding and made the decoding routine public. So the code we'll be utilizing utilizes that decoding routine rather than calling the API directly, because again, we don't want to provide credentials. Uh, we'll be using that decoded account ID to perform static IOC style matches against the list of account IDs used by Canary providers or by others who just post their keys on Pastebin. If there's a single match on Pastebin, then it's assumed to be a regular deception deployment by the defender. And if multiple matches are found on Pastebin with the same account ID, but differing key sets, it's assumed to be a Canary provider. That being said, I did say I scoured some uh, help forums and blogs and they definitely post their account IDs in there. So statically collected a couple as well. Now let's jump into a demo. 
On the right, you can see three different AWS API key sets we'll use for testing. I changed the secret values, so don't screenshot. Uh, so for this demo, we're utilizing a Python script that I created that will decrypt the access key ID into the account ID. Then runs a static match comparing the account ID to a list of known dad, either Canary provider account IDs or the account IDs from Canary's post on pastebin. It's worth noting this isn't the best detection as it is static and relies on the list I quickly created using namely one source, pastebin. Um, but for now, it's the only method for catching these canaries publicly. Uh, so we can see in the beginning, we match to a canary provider on the first example. The second uh, example, the account ID that generated that canary is unique. And the third match to a single person on pastebin. All right, blue teamers, let's go beyond just adding credentials to files. For example, number four, we'll be looking at our last user access canary, credentials stored in LSAS. Because this canary is stored in memory, it presents two unique problems for defenders. First, in order to live in LSAS, there must be an active session running with a, via background process. If that process is killed, the credentials will no longer reside in memory. Second is in order to persist, you need to re-inject into memory after each boot cycle because it's ran. Uh, defenders here have two primary implementation options when it comes to storing credentials in LSAS. First, they could authenticate with a fake account or a real account using invalid credentials, utilizing Windows logon or process create functions with the logon net credentials only or logon32 logon new credential flags. They could do this directly in code or as often described in deception blogs and trainings, they could use the binary runas.exe with the net only option. When used, uh, that process that was spawned uses the same token as the caller, but the system creates a new logon session within LSA. And most importantly, the process impersonates the specified credentials without validation. Another option defenders have is to create unprivileged Canary AD accounts and authenticate the systems using them to store credentials in LSS. This is definitely the better option when implemented correctly, but has its own major drawbacks when it comes to scaling and management. Now let's look at LSS-based canaries from the red teamer's perspective. The implementation the blue team chose is fake counts or the net only implementation. So on the right, you'll see a Mimikatz MSV dump uh, with the canary in red. MSV collects hashes from LSS in particular. So how do we detect when LS credentials in LSS are fake account? How do we detect when credentials in LSS are fake account canaries? Well, we utilize our own logging against them. An often forgotten about stage in the deception engineering process is to clean up any artifacts spawned. One of these artifacts is system logs. Windows event ID 4624 triggers when an account is successfully logged into. Even though we aren't validating the authentication of this user, it still spawns a 4624. Specifically, it'll fire with a logon type nine with the subject account name being equal to the new logon account name and the network account name not being equal to the account name. Since this is an in-memory canary, this authentication and therefore log must occur after each boot cycle. So for this demo, I start off by utilizing runads.exe with the net only flag to inject two sets of credentials in the memory. The first user is a valid domain user administrator with an invalid password. Obviously we don't wanna use a valid password because of OPSEC. <laughs> and the other user, fake user, doesn't exist in the environment at all. Next, I'll run a script that I'll provide later that searches through the Windows event, uh, security event logs looking for a 4624 with a logon type nine since the last boot that matches the criteria in the last slide. If canary, if canary credentials are found in LSAS, the script will output the steps taken in yellow, the user who created the canary in green, and the canary username in red. Since we're just searching through the event logs, nothing will trigger an alarm and it's really fast. So for our last example, we'll be looking at a different type of canary. Service abuse canaries are services running on systems that will generate a web or DNS request when killed. These work if you stop the service via SC, net stop, or just by killing the pro uh, services process. These can be implemented as a single service or a group of services to alert only when a certain number have been stopped. For implementation, you realistically have two options. 
First is to create a binary with a function to make a web or DNS request when killed. You could do this yourself or check out NCC Group's killed process canary. Uh, your second implementation option is to create a sim alarm for process exit events firing on that process name, Windows Event ID 4689. There are two main problems with this implementation though. First, this requires auditing on the process termination policy, which isn't enabled by default in most organizations due to its noise. Second, if named cleverly, you'll get false positives for legitimate binaries you're mimicking when they exit. All right, Red Teamers, as a general rule to begin with, you should never try to evade defenses by disabling them. Uh, that's, you should never evade defenses by disabling them in such a stupid manner as killing the process. It's a better way to put that. Uh, but it is common knowledge that some less intelligent attackers do this. So they just try to kill every service, every process that seems like it's security based at all. And defenders are well aware. But in case you're crazy, let's go over killed process canaries from the Red Teamers perspective. The implementation we'll be enumerating is an embedded binary with a function to make a web or DNS request when killed. The reason we chose this over the process exit implementation is because it's far more common just due to noise and audit policy requirements. Since the blue team is either writing the binary themselves or using NCC groups, it will be unsigned. This combined with knowing that the canary is most likely to alert via web or DNS gives us enough information to detect the canaries, even on clustered enterprise systems by simply examining the binaries. So now we'll test our detection with a demo. All we're doing here is just enumerating the current services that are running processes, checking for unsigned binaries, viewing them in raw format, and then running regex on it, just looking for HTTP syntax or the syntax for common DNS request functions while excluding common domains. The output will be the current process it's scanning, its process ID, and if it's determined to be a canary, the match. All right, now blue teamers, I can't give you a step-by-step -step on how to implement canaries as then the information is public for attackers. You guys need to get creative. Here are a few basic rules to follow instead. First, obfuscate your code. Many binary-based canaries are traceable just from examining the ex executable. Sign your binaries, wrap them, pack them, do whatever you need to do. Use alternative callback methods rather than just HTTP or DNS requests. For the killed process canary, for example, you know that canary will only ever spawn in your environment because it's statically in your environment. So you could generate a log, for example, a system log rather than a web or DNS request to mix up your alerting capabilities a bit. Next, hide your deception infrastructure. Improperly configured or reused deception infrastructure can give away your canary before it's even touched. Make sure when using cloud-based canaries to use existing tenants for Azure, but unique accounts for AWS. Finally, limit fake credential use in canaries. Fake credentials can have their use, it's just very limited. You're better off creating canary AD accounts and ensuring its AD attributes are deceptive. Only ever use fake credentials for apps or services that don't leave engineering artifacts. Finally, I created a GitHub account to host the scripts I use in today's talk. Keep in mind, these are just quick scripts designed for portability, live off land assessments. They're not a fully developed tool at all. If there are any problems with the code, blame chat GPT. <laughs> also honorable mention, make sure to check out Honey Pop Buster by Javelin Networks. This was created a few years back. Uh, Javelin is a deception vendor that got bought out by an XDR company. Uh, but before they went, they posted some uh, anti-deception techniques as well. They were the only instance that I really found online. Uh, I didn't do any of the techniques that they did. I tried to mix it up, but they have great logic when it comes to Canary AD users. That's it. Questions? Thanks for your talk. Uh, there was one question that I've had so far, which was about, um, I think, demo one, the uh, file open demo. Mm -hmm. um, would it also be a, by a canary bypass to just exfiltrate the document over C2 and then open it in on an offline system? Not if they built the canary to alert to an external. That's why when we're building the canary, we have it alert to external infrastructure. So no matter where the document is opened, it will still reach out to the external infrastructure. If they were to sandbox that, that could be a bypass. Um, 
yeah, the scripts, you already published that as well. So I think that's good. Uh, oh yeah, the, the AWS um, example as well. Um, so you mentioned that the AWS um, bypass was basically you um, hard coding the actual identifiers. Yes. Uh, is there any other thing that you can think of, may, not necessarily that you have to disclose, but that people can further research on? Or do you, is that the only thing just browsing and hoping that you can find some identifier? So I will say that I made this presentation pretty quickly. I didn't look at all methods. Um, there might be an internal AWS API that can help you out. Generally, you're just trying to get more information from the API and then do analytics on that information. As far as I was researching, I didn't see anything for AWS uh, account IDs translating to any other detections. Okay, um, that's it for the people online. Any questions here in person? No? All right. Oh, yep. Hi. Thank you. Um, as a blue teamer, my matter is about uh, false positive. If I deploy some canaries, I'm afraid that. Uh, uh, some scheduled task or migration will trigger because uh, mm -hmm. we'll read the file. Is there any tool to uh, to avoid these uh, this kind of uh, false positives? Yeah, so that's where we come to the fidelity of the uh, canaries, is you want to keep them as hidden as possible. If you're creating canary alarms on like a file touch interaction, for example, every vuln scanner, every file scanner, every sysadmin will touch that file and then generate false positives. The key there is to put it in places where system either system processes or users don't normally access, like LSAS, for example. If you're storing them in there, the only people that are going to be dumping LSAS is likely to be nefarious. Kind of the same uh, uh, for the file access uh, when when uh, kind of architect and deploy those canaries. Is there any way to protect, detect, and protect against uh, canary uh, detection um, techniques that you show in in Red yeah. Team? Yeah. So uh, in the lessons learned slide, I was trying to go over that a little bit. It's mostly about obfuscating your code, mixing up your alerting mechanisms. Most most canaries out there right now are alerting with HTTP or DNS. Try to do something unique. Spawn a new artifact if you can. Make a different type of protocol call if you're going to go external network. Um, just mix it up. I can't say specifics because then everybody yeah. knows. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.